welcome him as he comes. Give Pastor Brian a great big Wayworld Outreach welcome. We're starting a school in Kenya this year, and he's here to preach the word and tell us all the good things that are going on clear across the clear across the world. So we're glad to have you. We love you so much. Let's give a round of applause. For one more time, let's just lift up our hands and be in His presence. And Father, we are gathered here to listen to you, Lord. We are gathered here that you might give us a word to take us, Lord, from any form of infirmity, to take us, Lord, from any form of sickness, to take us, Lord, from where the enemy thought he got us. And right now, we declare that the heavens are here and we release every form of prison, every form, Lord, any form that the enemy has come. Your word says, Lord, that when the enemy attacks, Lord, you will raise a standard, Lord. And we are now raising a standard. We are now accepting your standard, Lord. And Holy Spirit, come and move. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Give the Lord a mighty hand clap as we leave this place. Thank you so much again. I'm really honored to be in your midst. I bless the Lord. Uh, this time I was sharing last Sunday that when I go to the immigration desk here, they asked me, where are you going? I told them I'm going home. And they told me, your accent is not American. Your passport is not American. I told them, no, I'm going home. And... Uh, I'm happy to be here. Maybe you might not understand. You might not be in my place to understand the magnitude. I remember, I just went back, my mind when I was worshiping the Lord there, I went back to the year 1998, 1999 to 2000, and I'm sure most of you here were not yet born, or most of you were born by then. And uh, this day that we received the death, the report that my father has died, and then I just went back to that season. And uh, I remember one night, in, this is now in 98, one night we are seated there. We, all we had was a cup of porridge, because that's all my mother could afford. And uh, we were four brothers seated there. And then we went to bed at night, and there was hunger. And we would feel hungry. I'm excited when I come here, like my stomach, I never feel hungry. There is food at every stop. But we used to feel hungry. And at night, I remember that night, my mother was like massaging our stomachs so that we can sleep. So when I was standing there, I was like, God, you are a good God. You are a faithful God. You keep your word. He says in the book of 1 Samuel 2.8 that he raises the poor from ashes. He says in the book of Psalm 29.11 that I am the Lord your God. And I give you strength. And he also says, not only do I give strength, but I give you peace that you might stand. And it is, it is a father who has called us. Jesus Christ is not on the ballot box. He's not there. We don't get to choose him. But he has always reigned from ages to ages. And we don't get to elect him. He stands right there as a king, and he's the Lord that we serve. So today, I just want us to go to the book of 1 Samuel. You're going to, to see this story here, and I believe you're going to get so much more from it. And uh, I honor all the authority of this house. 
our Pastor Marco, Pastor Robert. They are great people. Amen. Will you just give them an honor because they, they are doing a great job. And all the pastors, all the leaders who are laboring in this house, may God bless you. What you are doing is an internal investment. And the entire church, I really honor you because we are part of you. And we are one of you. And I bring you greetings from Kenya. Kakamega, Kenya, and uh, you know what is happening as we are sharing, Islam is planning to take over. I don't want to say they are taking over. They are planning to take over. And the way they are doing this, they are coming up with schools, they are coming up with banks. Now, they have banks. You can go get money without interest to them. So they are pushing their people. They want to control they are kind of, they want to control every, every aspect of life. So if they can control education, and then they can control every financial institution, and those are two great institutions, it means like they want to take over. But I thank you so much you accepted our call, and I believe very soon we shall be launching that school in Kakamega. That is the first Christian school. And... Uh, all the people that have been to Kakamega, I mean, it's a really nice place. You really want to come. And those of you who have not made that trip, please make a date with us. You are the only person, I mean, I'm the only person you get to see. But behind me, there is a lot of people, a lot of loving people, a lot of children, and you'd love to see them. Let's go to the word. I'm just going to be very brief tonight. I promise you I'm not going to preach for two hours because I understand here if you preach for more than two hours, you'll be here alone. So with the Holy... I know, but if everyone walks away, I know there'll be the Holy Spirit. So, but I believe there'll be one or two people and God will be here. Amen. <laughs> so I'm not taking two hours today. I promise you in a very short time, I'll be done. Uh, I want us to go to the book of First Samuel. Chapter 1. Let's just read verse 12 and 13. As she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her, seeing her lips move but hearing no sound. He thought she had been drinking. I don't want to read 14 because it's a rebuke. Father, we thank you for your word that it has come to time, Lord, that you want to speak to us. We pray that you will open our hearts and Holy Spirit will come and minister to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to share with us today a little title, Prayer in the Valley. Prayer in the Valley. A valley is a place you read in the Bible, a valley is described, one of the characteristics of a valley is that it is death. It represents death. When you are in a valley is a place where it is a place for the voiceless. When you are in the valley, it means when you shout, people cannot hear you. When you are in a valley, you are in a position where people cannot even see you. People cannot recognize you. But one thing about the valley is that when you are in the valley, your attention is on another level. When you stand on the mountains, destruction is everywhere. You get to see everything. You get to see all the beautiful things. But when you are in the valley, it's a place where the scenery is a place where people don't want to go. Maybe sometimes the only thing you'll get in a valley is water. And I want you to know that even the water that you might get in the valley is not always clean. It's dirty. It's not a conducive environment to be. In fact, a valley is a home for solitude conversations. A home where you get to speak to yourself, a place where you are hidden and no one can hear you. But the best thing in the valley is a place where 
humanity encounters divinity. You are in a place where no human being can come to save you. A place where no mother, no father, no friend can come to save you. But you are in a place where you need divinity. You need power beyond human help. And that's why Jesus said in Luke 18, 27, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And I came to speak to someone today who is in a valley. You've tried everything you can. You've tried to impress everyone. You've tried to move at any different point. But you are still stuck in the valley. I want to introduce you to someone called Jesus. He is closer to you. He is closer than a brother and he listens to you. You might shout out and people will not listen. But when you are in the valley, there is a name that you can call. There is someone that you can call. And he will listen to you. He will come down to your valley and listen to you. His name is Jesus. David says in Psalm 23, 4, Though I may walk in the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. A valley is a place of evil. A valley is a place of death. A valley is a place where you are kind of taking your last breath. And when you are walking in the valley, there is only one companion that will take you through the valley. His name is Jesus. That's why David says, I'm walking in the valley, but I will not fear evil. For thou art with me. Because at that moment, he is in the valley where nothing else is making sense. There are three conditions or three situations that will make you make this prayer. Remember the scripture that we just read. I know we pray prayers. But this prayer that you make in the valley is a prayer that has no voice. It has no voice. It is a prayer that you try to even get out words, but words cannot get out. You try to come out, you know, you try to say, I'm going to shout out, I'm going to shout the name of Jesus. But even that name of Jesus at that point, you cannot shout it out. Is a place. But what, who are the people or what conditions will make you make this prayer? And I know there are people here right now that are making this prayer. And I want to see these three conditions and then we are going to make this prayer. There are three seasons in your life, three places that will force you. Now, a prayer in the valley it sometimes is a prayer that it will force you. You'll find yourself making that prayer. Number one candidate will be when you are in the season of barrenness. And we meet this young lady or this woman here, Hannah, without a child. And she is in her season of barrenness. Barrenness is not the absence of seed. In barrenness condition, the seed has already been provided. Whatever is needed for you to birth, your miracle is already there. But there are conditions. There are, there are conditions beyond human solution that make you stick, that make you remain in that season of barrenness. The Bible says in 1 Samuel, that verse that we just read, we are introduced to Penina. And verse 12 says, and Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. So Hannah is experiencing a season, oh, Penina is experiencing a season of harvest. But Hannah is experiencing a season of barrenness in the same situation, in the same house. 
I know here in the U.S. you might not understand this when they are talking about polygamy. Now, let me tell you about polygamy because my grandmother was a fourth wife. And it means you are in a state where you have one man. And in this case, Elkanah had two wives. Polygamy. Now, this situation Hannah finds herself in if I will teach you more, is that every day she came back, she had two encounters. She had an encounter with Elkanah, but at the same time, she had an encounter with Penina. Now, polygamy, even in the Jewish culture, you'll find they used to live in homesteads. Just the way we did in Africa, people live in the same homestead. It means, like, if it is Hannah, she didn't live, like, maybe, let me say, she's in... Uh, Tijuana and Penina is in San Bernardino. No, 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 no. They used to live in the same homestead. They used to experience, like they used to experience their daily living together. And now, Hannah is in a season where she is not giving birth. But Penina is giving birth. So the seed is already there, but there is no fruit coming out. We are sometimes in barren conditions. Everything for us to succeed is there. Things don't just happen. Everything for you to succeed has been availed. But there is something when you are in barren situation. It is beyond human understanding. And this is why you need divinity. You need divine power to be able to take you from that place. And then she finds herself in this situation. And in that culture, if you are barren, it was considered like you had a secret sin. Like you had something secret. Like if you are doing, if everything is not happening to you, and that is humanity, if things are not working for you, it means like you did something wrong. You are now harvesting the fruit of your sins. And that is the world that we have been introduced to. If everything is not working, people tend to give you that answer like, this thing is not working for you because of this and this and this and that. And that's what we get ourselves in every day. People have actually that tendency of defining some situations in our lives. They link that situation to something that we did. They link a situation to something that you didn't do well. So you are standing here. It might not be your fault. I don't know the whole story behind Hannah. But it might not be her fault that she is experiencing barrenness. Even in our situations, we reach some places, it is not your choice that you are experiencing or you are in a desert place or you are in a valley. You just found yourself in a valley without choice. I was talking to another lady, we led her to Christ before I came and uh, we found her at a point where she wanted to commit suicide. So we were sent out there by one of the people to go and, you know, just minister to her. So we arrived there. We were like, why do you want to commit suicide? She said, I feel so burdened because I am HIV positive and I am 22 years. And this was not my own doing. It was my mother's doing since birth. And so she is in a place where she did not choose. But if anyone encountered her along the way, would say this is careless living. But then she is harvesting. She is in a place where she didn't have a choice. She just found herself in this place. So in our season of barrenness, we have to understand that God's power has always been released. That God's blessing has always been released. The fact that we are not experiencing it right now doesn't mean that it is not going to happen. It is going to happen, but God has predestined plan. Romans 8.30, he says, for those he has called, he justified. And those he justified, he predestined. 
and those he justified, he also glorified, so that they can carry out his will. And something else also, uh, I love Paul when he says in Ephesians chapter 1, he says that even before the foundations of the earth, before the foundations of the earth, your life was predestined, your purpose was predestined, so that you might be here at this time to be able to achieve that. The second condition that will make you make this prayer is when you are restless. There comes a point in your life that you must choose to be restless. Hannah, we encounter Hannah here in 1 Samuel 1.10. And the Bible says, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept and so. When you realize your purpose, you will get the zeal to reach out for more. A season of restlessness is a point where you realize your purpose is not being achieved. So you realize there is something you need to do for you to activate your purpose or for you to realize your purpose in life. So here we encounter Hannah. She goes before the Lord. And they had been going there. They have been going to the temple. They have been going to the temple. And you realize the Bible says, ear and ear, they went to the temple. But there is this time that they went to the temple. And she said, enough is enough. She said, enough is enough. I am tired of this situation. So it is until something happens to us. And we reach that point and we say, I have come to an end of this. It is until you sleep on that bed and say, now, I don't want to do this anymore. You get to a point and you realize your purpose is not, you are not living according to your purpose. You are not fulfilling your godly given purpose. That is the only point you reach and say, I am now restless. I love this story here. If you read the story between Esau and the brother Jacob, Genesis twenty-seven forty, he says, by your sword you shall live and serve your brother, and it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from the neck. It is not when you get your next provision. No. It is not when you achieve your dream. No. It is not when you win the next lottery. No. He says when you become restless. Walking every day, moving every day, and we think our life, we think we are living our purpose. We think we have achieved our purpose. It's a dangerous place to be. Comfort. Comfort place is the most dangerous thing that can ever happen to someone who is not pursuing their purpose. You must come to a place when you say, this is not how it is supposed to be. This is not how my life is supposed to be. And you now say, I am going to connect to a higher power, to a power that is beyond me, to a power that is beyond this situation. And you now move and say, I am restless. Restlessness will make you realize your potential. It will make you work out for more. It will make you pray more than you ever did before. Everything has been given to us, but there is a connection. There is a channel. The Bible says that he has blessed us with every blessing, every blessing. But now, there is, there is in this system, there is a way that the blessings are taken up from heaven. It is through prayer. When you talk about prayer, I love just to sneak in this. 
prayer, the power of prayer is in its consistency. It's in its consistency. Keep on going. But being restless, being restless is a place where, I mean, people might say, oh, because you are talking about getting more, getting more, getting more. No, there is always more that you have to achieve. There is always some more. It's not, it's not an atmosphere where we are saying we are being ungrateful. No, it's not that we are being ungrateful. It's just that we have realized there is got to be more. In the, season of, in the season of restlessness, there are three voices that will speak to you. The first, the first voice is what we heard. You will speak to yourself. You remember even the prodigal son. When everything came to an end, the prodigal son decided to have a meeting with himself. He decided to sit and say, I'm going to talk to myself. This is not where you are supposed to be. The second voice you will always listen when you are in the season of restlessness is the voice of your adversar adversaries. Your adversaries will, pro will provoke you to move to your next season. Your adversaries will always provoke you to move to another place, to take it to another step. And you hear here, 1 Samuel 4, 6, and her adversary also provoked her soul. For her to make feet because the Lord had shut her womb. And Penina is talking to Hannah. And I always tell people that speed is not an advantage if you are going to the wrong direction. It's never an advantage if you are taking the wrong direction. So God had his own speed to Hannah's life. Just because it was working for Penina, Hannah had to be patient and wait for her own time. And so in this season, there is a voice of an adversary speaking to her and telling her, ah, you need to get out there. But this is a voice that will always mock you. We thank God for voices that will always mock us. They make us take another level. The third voice in your season of restlessness that will speak to you, and we have to be very careful of convenient voices. In this verse here, there is a convenient voice speaking to Hannah, and the convenient voice is telling her, then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, why do you cry, and why do you not eat? Why are you not sad and discontent? Am I not better to you than ten sons? On the journey of purpose, the devil will always make you bargain for less. He will always make you bargain for less. There are people in your life that you have to be careful. They will love to pamper you. They will love to pamper you. You know your purpose is to get a child, but they will pamper you and say, am I not enough? You know your purpose is to move to the next level, but there are some voices that will speak to you and tell you, isn't this just not enough? You have to get away from that circle, or you have to silence that circle. The circle that always encourages you to settle for less. When you realize your purpose, and God has given you your purpose, you have to walk and fulfill that purpose. You have to fulfill it. And be careful of the inner circle. We always call them the inner circle. They are just happy when you are doing it on, the, on, on their level. They are always happy when you are achieving it on their level. Because one time I realized... I realized one time that they say, you know your friends when you are in bad situation. Sometimes you know your friends when you are being elevated. How many people are ready to stick with you? Know that you are not going to be together with them at this level. They are going to be happy for you when you move to this level. And they will be there with you and celebrate you. But they will love to pamper be careful of the Elkanas in your life. They pamper you with 10 minutes prayer. They say you are doing okay. 
they pamper you with your current situation and they say you are doing okay. No, you have to reignite yourself and move out and know there is going to be more than this. The last place that will make you make this prayer is when you realize you are in your season of manifestation. Your season of manifestation will open the places that you are supposed to go. Our appetites. Amen. Our appetites or our desires that push us even to prayer, they're not even closer to what God is thinking about you. They're not even closer to what he's thinking about you. We sometimes, not sometimes, God's love is so high that we sometimes think less of it. First Samuel 1.3 where Hophni and Phineas, the sons of Eli, were the Lord's priests. The war was not about Hannah. It was not about Hannah. This war was beyond Hannah's prayer. This war, Hannah was praying for a son. But Israel was suffering because the sons of Eli were not doing the right thing. So as far as Hannah was praying for God to give a child, the Lord God was seeing something bigger in Samuel that goes beyond a child. Hannah was waiting for a child to come in her house, but the Lord God was looking for a son to save the nation. Whatever you are asking God for in the season of manifestation is far beyond what you are thinking of. That miracle is not just for you. It's not just for you. It goes beyond your house. It goes beyond your city. It goes beyond your nation. So as much as you are asking him for that, God wants you. He's the one who puts that desire in you. That desire didn't start with you. So that desire started from the heavens. And when he watches from the heavens, his mind is not our mind. His thoughts are not our thoughts. But he is thinking on a level higher. He's just using us as a conduit at this moment. And when Hannah was actually there praying, she, she didn't understand that this prayer was beyond her. She didn't understand that the answer that was going to come was beyond her. It was a prayer for the nation. It was a prayer to save souls. It was, a it was a prayer to bring a man. And you read Samuel. The Bible says that none of his words fell to the ground. Before Samuel died, he stood up and he said, Is there anyone? Is there anyone who is accusing me of anything? That is a man. I don't know how many of us can stand here today and say, Is there anyone? Who is accusing me of anything before you die? This is the man. This is the dream that Hannah was carrying. This is, this is when the enemy realizes your purpose. When the enemy realizes what you are supposed to bring. When the enemy realizes that you are carrying something bigger. Something stronger, something that is going to change the entire world, he tries to bring it down. But I'm here to speak to you today that whatever he thinks, whatever he says, whatever he mentions, whatever word that he has said, it is not going to hold on. I remember one time. I was, I came to this land, and before I came to this land, I always told people that it's not easy to come to this land here. It's not easy. 
you guys have a privileged passport. Because with the American passport, you can go anywhere in the world, anytime. For us, before you get here is a, is a testimony in itself. In fact, I remember I had to go. I had to go to the mountains for three days to pray and fast before I went for this visa appointment. And before I went there, after this prayer, I went there and everything went well. And God had answered the prayer. And I said, God, I thank you because you've answered this. Then I came to this nation thinking everything is going to work out well. Thinking as long as I step my foot on this feet, I'm going to share my story and everyone is going to listen to me. And back at home, I had more than 100 children waiting for me to bring food, waiting for me to go back with good news. And I remember sitting out there, tried every door locked. I was here for the first time three months, and everything, every door was locked. And this is what informed this sermon. And when I got just the night before I came here, I said, God, you know it all. You know it all. I have tried everything. I have tried everything. So I went on my knees and raised up my hands. And I was like... I couldn't utter the words, but I said, God, I've tried my best, and now this is my end. As we go back, we are going to close that place. But from now, you know I have done what I can. But when I was praying that, I was seeing the children, I was seeing my life. But the Lord was seen at church. I was seen every other thing about me. But the Lord was seen some ladies on the streets lost. I was looking at what I can do. But the Lord was seeing a nation. The Lord was looking at something that needed to be birthed. And I don't know if you are here. I want to welcome you to this grace. I serve a God who answers prayer. And maybe you are in the valley. You might be in the valley today. You do not have someone else to call. Right now, just move ahead. There is an answer for you. If you have reached to the end of yourself... You feel like you've tried everything. You've tried every place you can. You've tried everyone. But today, the Lord is here for you. The Lord is here for you. He is faithful. I'm telling you, he is faithful. So if you are there and you are feeling like right now there is a voice you need to call, you need divine power. You need divine, divine intervention, not just prayer, but you need divine intervention. This is your time for you to come. And I know, I know there is a God that we know. If there is a man to pray, there is a God who answers that prayer. I'll invite you here right now. We are going to pray with you. We are going to lay hands on you, and I believe in that valley, if you are in that valley today, if you are in that place where you are feeling, this is enough of me. I've come to an end. If you are feeling you are restless, restless, and you say, today, I want to move forward because I'm tired. If you are barren in any situation, might be financial, might maybe you are trusting God for something bigger and you feel you need it right now. There is a miracle for you right now. There is a miracle for you right now. It is not late. You can still give birth. 
you can still give birth even today. His presence is here. His presence is here ready to touch you. His presence is here ready to touch you. His presence is here. It can move you. You can still move into your season of harvest. You can still move into your season of harvest. I know it's been hard. I know it's not been easy. I know things have not worked out for you. But right now, he is calling out. He's calling out your name. He knew you. He formed you. And he's right now calling on you. It might be a marriage. It might be the hardest time in your marriage. And you are saying, I'm tired. I want to change. I want some change. I want to move to another level. The power of God is here ready to touch us. Yes, Lord. How many of you appreciate that word for Pastor Brian? Appreciate his life here tonight. Thank you, Pastor, for that awesome word. Once you all stand to your feet, we're going to close this. And these altars are open, as Pastor said, to every single one of us who's in that restless place. I love that. Some of us need to be in that restless place tonight to recognize I need something I don't have. I need power that I don't have. I need help that I don't have. And tonight, Pastor Brian made it such a clear presentation of the gospel, something that our pastors have committed to, to present at every service. And tonight, I know there's maybe a few of us here that you've not yet made that, that prayer in the valley yet. You've not yet come to the place where you recognize, I'm, I'm in need and I don't have the power that I need. And tonight, I want to invite you, if you're in that place, you can come and get this prayer, but it's the power that you've, you're, you're looking for, the power that you need, the power to make it through this valley, the power to have that prayer answered. It only comes from one place, and that's through the name and the, the blood of Jesus Christ. Some of you may have found yourself in a valley because of your own failures, of your own mistakes. Some of you might find yourself there tonight because of circumstances that were outside of your control. But no matter how you ended up there, I want you to know there is a Savior that you can call on tonight. There is a Savior that you can cry out to, and He will respond. He will come into that valley with you. He will deliver. He will save. But it requires you saying, I need it. I need that Savior. I need Jesus in my life. On the count of three, if there's anybody in here that's saying, I need Jesus. I want Jesus in my life. I need a power that I don't have. I want you to raise your hand. Don't let anything hold your hand down tonight. Tonight could be the night that prayer begins to be answered. That valley begins to turn into a place of fruitfulness. On the count of three, anyone that wants Jesus in their life, that's ready to surrender, one, two, three. Put your hands up all across this room. I see those hands. I see those hands. I see your hand. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Anybody over here? I see these hands. Thank you. Would you allow us? I see your hands, sir. Come on down right now. Would you allow us to have the honor and the privilege of being a part of your breakthrough tonight? Come forward right now and pray with some of our altar workers. Pray with these people. They're prayed up. They're ready to help you guys. Come now. Come now. If you raised your hand, go ahead and come now. God, they're right now. So church, we got people coming right now that are giving their lives to Jesus. They're giving their lives to Jesus. Get excited. Get excited. We're great. We're so grateful. We're so excited that you're choosing Jesus tonight. That's why we're here. We're here so that you would make this decision to experience the power, to experience the life that is found only in Jesus. Before we dismiss tonight, I just want to pray together with every one of you who's come forward. Our altar workers, I know many of you are already praying. Don't, don't, don't feel like you need to stop praying with them. But for every single one of you who's ready to pray a prayer of surrender, I just want to lead you. There's nothing in the words that matters. It's all about your heart. 
It's all about where you're at tonight. Expressing to God, I need you. Expressing to God, I want you. Expressing to God, I'm done with my way. I'm done with this valley, and I'm ready for more. So would you pray with me? Jesus, I need you. I'm done with my way. I want your help. Come into my life and save me. I love you. I'm going to serve you. Change my life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. Amen, amen. All right. Wow. A lot of people getting set free here. If you could continue just to pray for those who are at the altar. If you need to go, that is totally fine. We love you. We're looking forward to seeing you this Sunday for our Palm Sunday Kids Musical. Don't miss that. Make sure to grab some flyers to invite people on the way out tonight. And don't miss your opportunity to get a marriage challenge back at night. God bless you guys. Drive safe. We'll see you on Sunday in just a few days.